Welcome listeners, but take heed. We will say whatever we need to share our knowledge, thoughts, and joy, and even things that do annoy. Before we begin, please be aware, we have a tendency to swear. You have been warned, make no mistake, so join us now. We're for Fox Sake. Welcome to the 200th episode of For Fox Sake, a Harry Potter book movie compare and contrast podcast. I'm Carly, and the dad joke loving Gryffindor to my right is Ellen. How does Harry Potter enter a room? How? Through a Gryffindor. <sighs> okay, you didn't like that one. How about where might you find Dumbledore's army? Where? Up his sleevey. <sighs> okay, okay, I got a good one. What's the difference between a comma and crookshanks? One is a grammatical thing and the other is a cat? No. Well, yes, but no. Crookshanks has claws at the end of his paws, and a comma is a pause at the end of a clause. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't hate dad jokes, but you know. Well, fine then. Let's just fly into the Phoenix flashback. Last week, we covered the second half of Chapter 3, Will and Won't, and the corresponding film scenes that don't really correspond at all. The book gives us a lovely scene where we get to see Dumbledore blast the Dursleys for being trash to Harry. We find out Harry was left some goodies, baddies, by his dog father in his will, which means Harry now has a house and a particularly sassy house elf. The movie forever leaves us confused about what the fuck is going on by leaving all of this out and just having Harry meet Dumble in a random ass train station. But maybe that's foreshadowing their future meeting? During episode 199, Violent but Silent, our Potter pondering was, why do you think Dumbledore decided to finally confront the Dursleys about how they treated Harry? Hi, this is Jessica calling in my Potter pondering for this week. Why did Dumbledore wait so damn long to tell off the Dursleys? Well, he probably found out that the Order just did and realized he better do it too or he'd look even worse than he already does for never having done so. And he honestly, I imagine that he needed to like, physically stop McGonagall like every year from intervening because like she says, they're the worst sort of muggles imaginable. And she watched them for a day before they, they even had Harry. So it's like, you know she's been keeping tabs on him the whole time and reporting back to Dumbledore. The way they treated Harry is atrocious. And the fact that Dumbledore knew the whole time just how badly Harry was being treated. Everyone knew. You know, the Weasleys couldn't do shit about it. No, really, no one else could do anything about it because they understood the situation and all that. But they at least, like, threatened them, you know, Goblet of Fire, Arthur tried to talk to them, you know, at multiple different times than obviously the end of Order of the Phoenix when the rest of the Order, you know, intimidated and threatened them. And now Dumbledore is just like, oh, guys, you backed me into a damn corner. Now I gotta say something, too. Oh. Hey, guys, it's Jackson with my pot of pondering. Oh, what have I got to say about Dumbledore's reprimand of the Dursleys? Definitely too little too late. I mean, after, what, 15 years? <laughs> but I don't know. I don't know what to say. I mean, Dumbledore took that long, but then again, it's also at the same time so satisfying to hear it. Oh, so... You know, it's bad that he took so long, but it was just awesome to finally see it, I guess. So, just two sides of the coin. Thank you so much for your responses. Our trivia question last week was, what is Dumbledore's favorite flavor of jam? His favorite flavor of jam is raspberry. Congratulations goes to Kalista White Wolf. Yay! She got it on Podbean. 
I set the alarm for 7.59 to remind myself to post it, but apparently giving myself a whole minute was too long, and in that minute, I forgot that I was supposed to post it to Facebook. So Kalista got it on there. I posted it to Facebook, and Jessica copied her answer saying, hashtag didn't know this one anyway. This means Kalista keeps her streak. She's at five weeks in a row, creeping up on our top winners, Megan and Mike. She's about halfway there. Think she can keep it up? You never know. For now, let's dive into the first half of Chapter 4, Horace Slughorn and the corresponding film scenes. Chapter 4, Horace Slughorn, Part 1. Even though Harry had spent every waking moment hoping Dumbledore was truly coming to fetch him, Now that he actually has, he feels a little awkward. Harry has never had a proper conversation with his headmaster outside of Hogwarts, and there was usually a desk between them. He is also still embarrassed by their last meeting when he smashed several of Dumbledore's prized possessions. Despite all this, the old wizard is completely relaxed and tells Harry to keep his wand ready. Harry questions this since he isn't allowed to use magic outside of school, but Dumbledore simply gives him permission to use any counter jinx or curse that may occur to him if they are attacked. He also adds that he doesn't think he will be attacked since they are together. He stops at the end of Privet Drive and mentions how since Harry hasn't passed his apparition test, he will need to hold on to his arm very tightly, requesting it be his left arm since his wand arm is a little fragile at the moment. When Harry grips his arm, Dumbledore says, here we go, before they twist into nothing, feeling pressed from all directions and unable to breathe. Harry feels as though there are iron bands tightening around his chest and that his eyeballs and eardrums are being forced deeper into his head and then he can breathe again. Privet Drive has vanished and he and Dumbledore are now standing in a deserted village square. Harry realizes that he just apparated for the first time in his life. Dumbledore asks if he's okay, and Harry says he's fine, but he thinks he prefers brooms. The headmaster smiles and then leads him past an empty inn and a few houses. He asks Harry if his scar has been hurting, and Harry unconsciously rubs his forehead, saying that it hadn't, and he'd been wondering about that since he thought it would burn all the time now Voldemort's more powerful. Dumbledore explains that he had thought otherwise, since Voldemort is now aware that Harry has been enjoying access to his thoughts and feelings, and appears to be employing occlumency against him. Harry says he isn't complaining, and then asks his headmaster where they are. Dumbledore informs him that it is the charming village of Budley Babberton, and Harry follows up, wondering why they are there. Realizing he hasn't told him yet, Dumbledore explains that they are there to persuade an old colleague of his to come out of retirement and return to Hogwarts. Harry isn't sure how he can help, but Dumbledore thinks they'll find a use for him and directs him to turn left. They proceed up a steep, narrow street, and the odd chill in the air makes Harry think of Dementors. He asks why they couldn't just apparate into his old colleague's house and Dumbledore responds that it would be as rude as kicking down the door, and most wizarding dwellings are magically protected from unwanted apparators. He tells Harry to take another left, and the clock on a nearby church strikes midnight, making Harry wonder why Dumbledore didn't consider it rude to call on his old colleague so late. However, he has more pressing things on his mind, and instead asks about Fudge being sacked, and if Dumbledore thinks the new minister is good. Dumbledore refers to him as able and says he has a more decisive and forceful personality than Cornelius. Harry waits, and when Dumbledore does not offer any information about the disagreement with Scrimgeour that the Daily Prophet reported, he instead brings up Madame Bones. Dumbledore quietly calls it a terrible loss, as she was a great witch. He then points to where they are headed with his injured hand and says, ouch. Harry tries to ask again about what happened to it, but Dumbledore simply says he has no time to explain now that it is a thrilling tale and he wishes to do it justice. His smile lets Harry know he can keep asking questions, so he does, 
bringing up the Ministry of Magic leaflet about security measures. Dumbledore asks if he found it useful, and Harry admits that he didn't really. Dumbledore figures he didn't, since he didn't ask him about his favorite flavor of jam to make sure he is indeed Professor Dumbledore and not an imposter. Harry isn't sure if he's being reprimanded or not, but Dumbledore just lets him know that it is raspberry but also says that if he were a Death Eater, he would have been sure to research his own jam preferences before impersonating himself. Harry says right, then mentions how the leaflet said something about Inferi, and he wonders what they are. Dumbledore calmly explains that they are dead bodies, enchanted to do a dark wizard's bidding. They haven't been seen for a long time, since the last time Voldemort was powerful, but he kills enough people to make an army of them. They approach a small stone house with a garden, and Dumbledore stops at the gate. Harry isn't fully paying attention since his mind is on in fury, and he ends up walking right into the headmaster. Dumbledore says, oh dear, oh dear, and Harry follows his gaze up the front path to see the door is hanging off its hinges. After checking to make sure the street is deserted, Dumbledore tells Harry to get his wand out and follow him. They make their way through the gate and up the garden path, then light their wands as they carefully go through the door to find a scene of total devastation, made up of destroyed furniture, broken china, and what appears to be blood spattered all over the wallpaper. Dumbledore says it isn't pretty and that something terrible has happened there. He moves to the center of the room and looks around carefully, finding no sign of a body. Harry thinks that maybe there was a fight and he was dragged off, but Dumbledore, who was peering at an overstuffed armchair lying on its side, says he doesn't think so. Without warning, he plunges the tip of his wand into the seat of the armchair, which yells, ouch. Dumbledore straightens up and says, good evening, Horace, and Harry is shocked to see that a fat, bald old man is now crouching, rubbing his belly, where the chair was. He has a giant silver mustache and is wearing a maroon velvet jacket over a pair of lilac silk pajamas. He gets to his feet, reaching only up to Dumbledore's chin, and tells him there was no need to stick the wand in that hard. He wonders what gave him away, and Dumbledore points out that there was no dark mark like there would have been if the Death Eaters had really come calling. Horace mutters that he knew he was forgetting something, but he wouldn't have had time anyway, since he was just doing the finishing touches to his upholstery when they entered. Dumbledore offers to help him clear up, and the two old wizards wave their wands in an identical sweeping motion, sending everything back to its original places. All the rifts, cracks, and holes heal, and the walls wipe themselves clean. Dumbledore asks him what kind of blood that was, and Horace calls back that it is dragon's blood. He mentions that it was his last bottle, and prices are sky high at the moment, but it might be reusable. He inspects the crystal bottle and finds it to be a bit dusty, before noticing Harry and his lightning bolt scar. Recognizing him, he says, oh ho, and Dumbledore introduces Harry Potter to his old friend and colleague, Horace Slughorn. Slughorn immediately sees Albus's attempt to persuade him and tells him the answer is no. Dumbledore asks if they can at least have a drink for old time's sake, and Slughorn ungraciously agrees to one drink. Dumbledore smiles at Harry and directs him to a chair that looks a lot like the one Slughorn had just been impersonating. It is right by the fire and a brightly glowing oil lamp, which gives Harry the impression that Dumbledore wants to keep him as visible as possible. When Slughorn turns back around with a tray of glasses, his eyes immediately fall on Harry and he quickly looks away, giving a drink to Dumbledore and thrusting the tray at Harry before seating himself. Dumbledore asks how he's been and Slughorn says he hasn't been well due to a weak chest and rheumatism. He says he can't move like he used to, which is to be expected with old age, but Dumbledore points out how quickly he moved to prepare such a welcome on such a short notice, assuming he only had about a three-minute warning. Slughorn informs him that it was two, since he was in the bath and didn't hear his intruder charm go off, but he also reiterates that he's a tired old man 
who has earned his right to a quiet life and a few creature comforts. Dumbledore points out that he isn't yet as old as he is, and Slughorn, noticing his injured hand, bluntly tells him that he ought to think about retiring himself, since his reactions aren't what they were. Dumbledore agrees that he's slower than he used to be, but also spreads his hands wide to indicate that age has its compensations. Harry notices a gold ring set with a heavy black stone on his uninjured hand and sees Slughorn notice it as well, before Dumbledore asks if all of the precautions against intruders was for his benefit or for the Death Eaters. Slughorn tries to deflect, asking what they would want with a broken-down old buffer like him, but Dumbledore replies that he imagines they would want to turn his considerable talents to coercion, torture, and murder. He asks if they really haven't come recruiting yet, and Slughorn admits that he hasn't given them the opportunity, as he's been moving from Muggle House to Muggle House and never stays in one place for more than a week. The owners of the current place are on holiday in the Canary Islands, and it's been very pleasant, so he'll be sorry to leave. He describes how he uses a simple freezing charm on their burglar alarms and makes sure the neighbors don't spot him bringing in the piano. Dumbledore calls this ingenious, but also points out how tiring it must be for a broken-down old buffer in search of a quiet life. He begins to suggest he return to Hogwarts, but Slughorn cuts him off to bring up the rumors that have reached him about Dolores Umbridge and questioning how he treats teachers these days. Dumbledore informs Slughorn that Professor Umbridge ran afoul of their centaur herd and that he thinks he would have known better to stride into the forest and call a horde of angry centaurs filthy half-breeds. Slughorn calls her an idiotic woman, saying he never liked her, and Harry chuckles, drawing both older wizards' attention to him. He apologizes and explains that he never liked her either. The movie section starts out as Dumbledore side-along apparates Harry out of the train station. They twist into abstract lights and random shapes accompanied by Harry's scream before landing in the middle of a darkened street. Houses can be seen in the background as the camera zooms out to show the two. Harry pants and asks if he just apparated, and Dumbledore confirms that he did, most successfully, as most people vomit their first time. Harry gives a sarcastic, can't imagine why. Dumbledore doesn't respond, instead just turns around and walks past him and up the street. Harry turns to and hurries after him as the camera cuts to show an aerial view of them walking up the sidewalk. He welcomes Harry to the village of Budley Babberton and tells him that he assumes he must be wondering why he brought him there. With a little laugh, Harry responds that, after all these years, he just sort of goes with it. Dumbledore again doesn't respond, this time distracted by the house that they are standing in front of. The door is askew, off its hinges, and leaning open. He instructs Harry to take his wand out as he pulls his own from the sleeve of his blue-gray robes. Harry removes his own from his jacket, and the scene changes to show the two cautiously entering the house with their wands lit. They see more damage inside, including crooked pictures, knocked-over furniture, and scratch marks on the wall. Dumbledore whispers the name Horace as they carefully make their way through the house, stepping over broken glass and past more rubble. Harry notices a copy of the Daily Prophet on the floor showing the article about him being the chosen one, and sees some blood drip from the ceiling onto it. He looks up to inspect the damage to find a couple of holes exposing the wood supports, which are dripping with blood. Another drop lands on his forehead, but Dumbledore catches his arm before he can wipe it away. He dips his own finger into it and touches it to his tongue before looking suspiciously over at a silvery blue striped armchair. Holding his wand in front of him, Dumbledore slowly approaches the chair that appears to have a pair of shoes poking out from under the skirt. He pokes the chair with his wand and a man's head pops out of the top of it, exclaiming, Merlin's beard! The chair then stands up, taking on a slightly more human shape, and the man tells Albus there's no need to disfigure him. He begins raising and lowering his arms and legs and starts fully returning to a normal body as Dumbledore tells him he made a very convincing armchair, calling him Horace. Horace responds that it's all in the upholstery, saying he comes by the stuffing naturally, 
and asking what gave him away. Dumbledore points his lit wand towards the blood-stained ceiling and says, Dragon's blood. The light from his wand illuminates Harry and Horace reacts with an oh-ho. Dumbledore then introduces Harry to his old friend and colleague, Horace Slughorn, before telling Horace he knows who Harry is. Slughorn shakes away the last of his armchair disguise as he looks at him and calls him Harry Potter with a slight chuckle. He continues to stare at him as he makes his way to a door and locks it. Dumbledore asks him about all the theatrics, wondering if he was waiting for someone else. Slughorn insists he doesn't know what he means, but then confesses that the Death Eaters have been trying to recruit him for over a year, so he's been avoiding them by moving every week. He tells Dumbledore that the muggles who own the house he's in now are in the Canary Islands, and the headmaster suggests that they put it back in order for them. He waves his wand and all the debris and damaged furniture begins to put itself back together and return to their original locations. As Harry watches on in awe until the crystal piece from the chandelier causes him to look down, since it's trapped under his shoe. He lifts his foot and the crystal shoots back up to the ceiling, rejoining the rest of them. You know, all the way up until the very end of this scene was pretty fucking spot on. It was. It was a little less detailed, but... It was very good for a movie scene. Right. I think this is one of the closest movie scenes to the book that we have had since probably Chamber of Secrets. A good old Chris Columbus film. Yeah. Some of those details I was really missing. I'm sad we didn't get a raspberry jam line. I know. And I'm sad we didn't get how I ended the chapter line, which we'll get to. But all in all... What makes me the most sad is the fact that this is one of the few scenes we can actually say this about being accurate for this movie. However, when we were watching this movie, we were very surprised at how much they actually did put in that is in the book. It does line up really well. It does, but there is just so much detail that is actually legitimately important to the story that's left out. And things that were added in that weren't important to the story. You mean like tying Harry's shoe? Yeah. Oh. We'll get there. Yeah, we'll get there. Cringe indeed. Obviously, it starts out just a teeny bit different because the previous scene was so different. But the gist of it is the same. The movie jumps a little bit more into it, whereas the book kind of leads up to it. Because we actually have them walking down to the end of Privet Drive before they apparate. And just having a brief little conversation that Harry is super awkward about because this is the first time that he's ever just been walking side by side with a headmaster outside of school and talking to him without a desk between them. I love the description that Dumbledore is just blasé about it. He's just like, it's fine. Yeah, Harry's completely like, the last time that I saw this guy, I destroyed all of his things. This is so awkward. And Dumbledore's like, whatever. It's cool, yo. It's fine. Dumbledore tells Harry to keep his wand ready. And Harry says, but I thought I can't do magic outside of school. I like the little ding that they give this in the movie when they're in the astronomy tower. Mm -hmm. And Dumbledore's like, well, being me. Has its perks. Has its perks. But they give it, it's a little bit of this. It's a little bit of like, oh, it's fine because you're with me. That sentiment is definitely there. Unless, of course, you're watching Prisoner of Azkaban, the movie, in which case it's perfectly fucking fine for Harry to do magic outside of school. That's true. But Dumbledore just simply tells him that, you know what, you're with me. I give you permission You can do any counter jinx or curse that occurs to you if we are attacked. Although, it's unlikely that anybody's going to attack you right now. And Harry wonders why that is. And Dumbledore just simply says, because you're you're with me. me. They also do a callback to this later on when Harry's like, they're in the cave. And he says, but I'm with you, Harry. Yeah. And it's very nice. Then, like I said, they stop at the end of Privet Drive. And this is where they apparate, but they do have a brief little conversation. So Harry kind of has a clue about what's to happen because he mentions that, of course, you haven't passed your apparition test yet. And Harry says, yeah, I thought you had to be 17. He's like, yeah, yeah. So just hold on to my arm really tightly. 
specifically saying my left arm because my wand arm, my right arm, it's a little fragile at the moment. So Harry grips Dumbledore's arm. Dumbledore just says, here we go. And they describe it as this feeling of being pressed in from all directions that Harry like can't breathe. Yeah, Oof. and it feels like his eyeballs are like rolling back into his head and his eardrums are going further into his skull. And you know what? It does sound really unpleasant. I feel like if it's like flying. After you do it a couple of times, you're like, oh, okay, I can do this. Do you think chewing gum would help with apparating? What if you open your mouth and the gum doesn't come with you? <laughs> you splinched your gum. Whoosh! <laughs> and I lost half my gum. Dang it. <laughs> it's better than splinching yourself, though. True. But then eventually, actually probably pretty quickly all said and done, I imagine it feels like it takes a lot longer than it actually takes just because it's so unpleasant. Yeah, and it's the first time he's experienced yeah. it. Yeah, but eventually he can breathe again. And he sees that they are no longer on Privet Drive. They're in some deserted village square, which makes sense because it's after 11. Mm -hmm. And Harry's like, I just apparated for the first time. <laughs> Dumbledore wants to know if he's okay. And he thinks about it and says, yeah, I'm fine. But I think I prefer brooms. As it happens, we only get like the tail end of this in the movie. So Dumble gets Harry to grasp his arm. Firmly grasp it. It's a SpongeBob joke. Okay. <laughs> Firmly grasp it. Okay. It's also uh, what he said. That is what he said. And they uh, pop off into this random village with no explanation to Harry about anything, as per Dumbledore's usual BS. Yeah, there's a line in this chapter that sums up everything Dumbledore. I love it so much. <laughs> In response to Harry's comment about preferring brooms, Dumbledore smiles at him and then just kind of leads him on and everything seems to be empty. So I don't know if it's just because it's so late. This or... is one of those towns that like rolls up after 7 p.m., you know? I guess. But it, there's an empty end, some houses, it's dark, deserted, and... Dumbledore launches right into a conversation with him, wondering if Harry's scar has been hurting him, which makes Harry just automatically touch his forehead. As you do. And say that it hasn't been hurting him, and he's been wondering about that because he expected he'd feel it burn all the time now that Voldemort's becoming more and more powerful. Yeah. It always was the case that as he grew more powerful it began to hurt more and more and more. So he's like, he's at his peak right now. Why is this not hurting at its peak? This is a really interesting conversation because it has taken him 15 years to figure out that there's some sort of connection between him and Harry. Yeah. Well, he did blatantly get told of the connection at the end of the last book. He did. But it's like Harry has consistently been able to feel his feelings and his scar and stuff since his first year at Hogwarts. Mm -hmm. So, and I wonder if it ever pained him before then. Yeah, and he, he just, just didn't, didn't know. know why. Yeah, so it's kind of interesting that it's taken Voldemort, who is self-proclaimed genius, it's taken him this long to realize, oh, I have some, like, he knows what's going on. I kind of wonder if the lack of a body made it so that he couldn't feel it the same way Harry did. Oh, maybe. And then once he did get his body back, it had to be a little disorienting. If you spend like over 10 years without a body, finally getting back into a body would have to be a little bit overwhelming at first, I would think. We'll have to talk about this specific thing more, but I am really intrigued how Voldemort just survived as a spirit-ish type thing, but then got his body. The whole Horcrux thing is very interesting yeah, to me. Yeah, yeah. However... Despite Harry thinking that his scar would be hurting more, Dumbledore points out that he expected it to be the opposite because now Voldemort knows that that connection is there. And I love the way he words it because he specifically describes it as Harry enjoying access to his thoughts and feelings. I'm like, yeah. enjoying? Really? No. You think that Harry's been enjoying that? Although I'm sure that in Voldemort's mind, that is a great honor that potter does not deserve 
He's such a narcissist. It's uh -huh. fine. I really hate that we don't get this information in the movie. None of it. It's literally just the phrase that, oh, your scar hasn't been hurting as much because Voldemort figured it out. Yeah, and now he's employing occlumency against him. I don't, they give Harry so many visions in the last movie, and then in this movie, it's just like, eh, Voldemort's not really around. Right. <laughs> it's strange, but this- One line in this moment would have explained that away. It would have explained a lot of stuff, and it would have been nice to see, but what whatever. <laughs> Harry is not at all complaining about this lack of pain in his scar because I imagine that had to be very inconvenient and painful. So he just moves on and just asks where they are. Dumbledore says that they're in the charming village of Budley Babberton. Bing. Right? Got that in the movie too. And then Harry asks why they're there. And Dumbledore says, ah, of course, I haven't told you yet. <laughs> The entire plot of the entire series is Dumbledore saying, oh, of course, I haven't told you yet. But he does tell him now. He says that they're there to try to convince an old colleague of his to come out of retirement and teach at Hogwarts again. Which is also why they're there in the movie, but in a less detailed version. Yes. <laughs> Harry wonders how he's going to be able to help with that. And Dumbledore, you know, being vague, just says... I'm sure we can find a use for you. And then says, turn left here. He's like Google Maps. Turn, <laughs> turn left. left. Dumble never gives Harry full deets. Like, Dumble just gonna Dumble. What the hell, man? That is absolutely a Dumble. <laughs> I'll Dumble for you. They start to make their way up a steep, narrow street. So it's up a hill. And that same odd chill that was at the minister's office and at Privet Drive is also here. So Harry immediately starts thinking about the Dementors, which I imagine is what kind of follows along his next train of thought because he wants to know why. Like, clearly these are unsafe times. Why did they not just apparate directly into his old colleague's house? Okay, so Dumbledore answers this question and that, that would be very rude. And while I agree, why could you not just apparate to the front garden right it's the same deal when they get into the memories and they're watching that guy from the ministry he like apparates way far away from the gaunt's house and you're like you could have just apparated in front of the trees guys <laughs> i wonder if the magical protection that they have up can sense apparition within a certain distance and sound the alarm sooner so if they apparate further back and walk up to it the magic for the protection can't sense that somebody apparated and it buys them a little extra time to stealthily sneak up. I guess that would be true for Slughorn. I don't really think the Gaunts have, we can talk about this when we get there, but I really don't think the Gaunts are very good at magic. They had to have been at some point. Could be ancient. Like they've lived in ominous that house forever. Ominous is good at it. Yeah. So maybe Ominous set it up. Who knows? <laughs> we'll ponder when we get there. But yeah, like you said, Dumbledore describes this as being as rude as kicking down the front door. And, I agree. Right? But then also mentions that wizarding dwellings are typically magically protected from unwanted apparators. He brings up Hogwarts as an example, and Harry says, yeah, Hermione says you can't apparate there, and Dumbledore says that Hermione is quite right. I really hate at this part. He says, Hermione Granger told me that. Bitch, Dumbledore knows who Hermione is. You don't got to say her full name. Okay, but next week, we're going to talk about how he refers to Ron Weasley as Mr. Ronald Weasley and Hermione as Miss Hermione Granger. It's just that formal thing that he does, so maybe it just kind of rubs off on Harry. Dumb. Yeah, I don't know. What I love about this is there's a clock on a church that they're walking past, and it strikes midnight. Which causes Harry to wonder why Dumbledore doesn't consider it rude to call on his old colleague so late. And I think that's a very good question. I wonder if it's a weekday. I mean, if he's retired. Well, yeah, but if it's a weekday, that would make a lot more sense about why the town is basically rolled up oh, right yeah, now. that's Because people got to work the next day. But I'm intrigued because, yes, midnight is very late to be calling. But maybe he knows that Horace is a 
night owl. A night owl. Maybe. They do seem like they were at one time close. Yeah. So. He doesn't ask this question out loud, though, because he has far more pressing things that he wants to ask. And at this point, a conversation has already been established between him, so he feels comfortable enough to do it. And he brings up the fact that Corny Fudge was sacked. And Dumbledore says, I imagine that you also saw he was replaced with Rufus Scrimgeour. And Harry says, yes, I did see that. Do you think he's good? I love this conversation. This is a very 16-year-old talking to an adult about politics yeah. situation. Yeah, very do, well Do you think written. that they're a good person? Yes, no? Yeah, maybe. No? Uh, uh, uh. And Dumbledore gives the most diplomatic response that he possibly could. Like, that's an interesting question. He is certainly able. He is more decisive and a forceful personality than Cornelius. And Harry's Harry like, yeah, that's not what I was asking. And Dumbledore says, I know what you are asking. All I'm going to say is Rufus Scrimgeour is a man of action who's been fighting dark wizards all of his adult life and does not underestimate Lord Voldemort, which does not answer Harry's question. I think it does. I mean, it does. But I think Harry is not going to read into it to understand yes. that it does answer his question. However, in the audiobook, when Jim Dale reads this, he sounds really short with Harry when he reads that line, the, I know what you meant. Yeah. And I'm like, I love Jim Dale. He is my favorite one to listen to. I've never listened to the Stephen Fry books, but Jim Dale is my go-to dude. But when I heard that, I was like, I don't think that's how he said it. I don't it. think that's how he said it I don't it think either. he was short. I think it was like, no, I know what you meant, but I, I don't really want to answer you. <laughs> I want to be as diplomatic as possible. Yes, I'm, and he I'm is. I'm Elvis Dumbledore. Harry then waits to see if he's going to say any more about it. And you know that he's just hoping he's going to explain about the arguments that the prophet reported happened between him and Scrimgeour. But then he doesn't say anything. And you know he's not going to. But there was just that little moment of, oh, maybe he'll tell me. <laughs> He Harry, doesn't. You're so 16. <laughs> yeah. So he instead brings up the death of Madame Bones. Harry, we're not very couth at the moment. <laughs> this doesn't seem like something we should bring up. I'm not entirely sure what he is trying to ask about it because he just mentions it. And Dumbledore calls it a terrible loss, saying she's a great witch. I wonder if he's kind of thinking about Susan. Maybe. I mean, we do get it from his perspective. So you would think that if he was thinking about Susan, that... It would have been said, but I don't know. Maybe new minister means better action for Madame yeah, Bones. Maybe. I don't know. And for that matter, he could have just been wondering what happened to her. Mm, How yeah, it happened. True. Was it Voldemort? He doesn't get any more details because at this point, Dumbledore points to where they're headed, but he forgets ouch. and points with his injured hand, hand yeah. and it causes him to say ouch so harry is now successfully distracted from his line of thinking now he wants to know he asks again what happened to his hand and dumbledore says that he's got no time to explain now describing it as a thrilling tale that he wishes to do justice we do kind of get that in the movie it just happened in the previous movie scene. yeah it was very similar just wrong moment yes didn't line up very well and I would say that later on in the book, we do actually get this tale told, done to justice. I think so. But it's kind of between Dumbledore telling it, and then way later on in the seventh book, we get the rest of the tale the from Snape's thing, yeah. memories. So he doesn't ever fully get to bring it to justice himself, but he does better than no time to explain now, later on. <laughs> He does smile at Harry, which lets Harry know that he's not being snubbed and he is still allowed to ask questions. And at this point, Harry returns to his original line of thinking, which is all of the stuff he saw in the prophet and whatnot, stuff that had been sent to him while he was still at the Dursleys. So he mentions the Ministry of Magic leaflet about security measures. This part of the conversation is hilarious. Yeah, Dumbledore wants to know if he found it useful not particularly. Yeah, Harry's like, not really. And Dumbledore says, yeah, I figured you didn't because you did not ask me about my favorite flavor of jam to make sure that I am indeed Professor Dumbledore and not an imposter. And 
Harry's just standing there wondering if he's in trouble right now. He's like, was I supposed to ask that? I don't even know what the answer would be at this point. So, um, and then Dumbledore kind of lets him off the hook and just says, for future reference, it is raspberry. Which was our trivia question. It was. And he also says, however, if I were a murder muncher, I would have been sure to research my own jam preferences before impersonating myself. I'm going to be truthful right now. None of the murder munchers would think to reference your jam preferences. They no, don't know. not even a little bit. But I love the idea of security questions being kind of ridiculous and not very useful because how do you know what to ask? Like, that I assume true. you arrange that with that person ahead of time, but it's not like you can communicate that through OWL. No, because then somebody safe. would get it. Yeah. So you would have to meet up with them in order to establish these security questions. Well, Dumbledore has very interesting ways of getting messages to it's people, true. as we've seen in the Fantastic Beast movies. What would your security question be? Somebody that I know uses the security questions for, like, your password and to get your stuff. They use like really crazy things like the security question is what is your first car they use like board anglia <laughs> well yeah so they can remember because you never like i never remember am I, did i put the model the make the yeah the color blah 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 you know did i do all of that did i put the year so they just use like uh that car that came to life in the stephen king novel that one that's a very easy one to remember or chitty chitty bang bang or something like that oh it's that's very funny. fun so i don't know I, don't, I have no idea. What would your security question be? I'm trying to think of some of the security questions that they ask for password stuff, like you were just talking about. Obviously, I'm not going to share any of those. I don't think that I would use one of those, though. Right. Because those are a little too easy. Especially so something... in the wizarding community where it seems like everybody knows everybody. Right. Almost. Because the questions are like, what is your mother's maiden name? Okay, right. well. Not giving you that. Yeah. So not that that's not an easy one to figure out. For that people, is a though, pretty so. easy one to figure out. What did Who's oh, my I... favorite Harry Potter character? That's a, oh, I mean, yeah. I, I know that, though. Well, you do know that, but you're not. So I would, would know that dangerous. you're not an imposter. Yeah. If, if I encountered somebody trying to pretend to be you. Granted, you've also made that announcement on this podcast. So a lot of people know that now. But I couldn't ask that if we were in the wizarding world, because in the wizarding world, Harry Potter technically probably wouldn't exist. So I need to do something there. like, what's my favorite flavor of jam? <laughs> I don't really like jam. Like, oh, I'll put don't? it on biscuits. I love some jam. But there is a restaurant in, it's just outside of Nashville, called Loveless Cafe. The best biscuits ever. Well, it's in the South. Yeah. So they know how to do it. But they will literally bring it to you with, like, honey and three different kind of jams and butter. And you have to eat all of them with all of them. I can't pick a favorite. I guess that it's could true. be my answer. What's your favorite jam? All of them. <laughs> <laughs> What's I'm... your favorite potato? All of them. All of them. Exactly. Maybe I, I always say, question like that. I've never met a potato I didn't like. My mom always says, I never met a food I didn't like. So if you want to know more about me and why I'm a Hufflepuff, my mom's answer to that question yeah. is why. <laughs> I think that we should ask our keepers this and maybe they'll be more decisive than we are. I have it. I have it. I have it. You got it? What is your absolute... Favorite gift to receive? Blankets. Not socks. Blankets. <laughs> I do like socks, but blankets. My husband hates that we have so many blankets in our house because we do have a lot. The stuff that you see when you come over, that's only like a third of what I have. I have a lot of blankets, y'all. A lot of blankets. And I love a good soft blanket. Don't buy me one of them scritchy blankets. I ain't got time for that. Give me a soft throw that I can snuggle up in. I think mine would have to be what is my youngest cat's full name? Well, most everybody knows that. But can they say it? <laughs> it's Albus Percival. Professor. Professor. Okay. Well, you got to do the professor. You know. Or just all of my cat's names in general. I wonder if you could do like your wand. You know, like what's the core of my... Because who the fuck would know the core of your Unless wand? Unless you're telling people. That's not a bad one. Yeah. I like this. It's going to be our pondering. Okay. Anyway, back to the episode. Bruh. This is going to be a long ass episode. one. Right? I'm sorry, then back to the chapter. Okay. Because it's, like I said, going to be a long-ass mm -hmm. one. He brings up how in that leaflet, it said something about Inferi, and at this point, he doesn't Ugh. know what they are. Yeah. So, 
It specifically says that Dumbledore calmly explains that they are dead bodies enchanted to do a dark wizard's bidding. And I'm really glad the movie did not put this in because it probably would have been something like, dead bodies enchanted to do the dark wizard's bidding. Well, you know. (laughs) (laughs) This gives me Lord of the Ringsies vibes. Yeah. Like how Sauron does the wraiths. Yeah, the wraiths and all of that stuff. And then... I'm thinking about this because we just watched all the extended editions, but like he has the that random dude who's the mouth of Sauron. Have you watched the extended edition? Yeah. It's terrifying. Yeah. But I think about that. That guy was alive and he made that choice willingly. But that's kind of what I think about. Like Sauron has this hold over the rates, but the rates did make that choice. These in theory, they're not making that. Choice. No, they're but not. But it feels very uh, similar vibe, but. As previously stated on this podcast, you can't really do fantasy without doing Tolkien. So, yeah, that dude was a genius. Yep. But the inferior thing freaks me out because you do encounter them in Hogwarts Legacy and they are Mm -hmm. fairly terrifying. Yeah. I mean, it sounds terrifying. And as Dumbledore points out, Voldemort was the last person to have actually used inferior and he killed enough people to make them. So can you imagine just... Murdering people willy-nilly to create a dead person army. Evil. Swish has talked about this. Tiffany has a theory that every time he killed a person, he put it in the lake. And that's why there's so many inferior in the lake. Ew. But, you know, I think he's probably killed more people than that because... There are bodies left behind. There are inferior walking around, basically, is what they're saying. Yeah. So there are definitely... Like, that's probably... Maybe three fourths of what he's done sitting that, and that's a big lake. There's a lot of people in there. So, yeah, yeah, stressful. Like I said, horrifying. At this point, they have approached a small stone house with its, its own so little cute. garden, and there's a garden path through the gates. But they stop at the gate, <laughs> and Harry's so wrapped up in the horror that is in fear that he's not fully paying attention and literally walks into Dumbledore. My taillights are out. I love it. But Dumbledore doesn't care because he's too caught up in what's going on with the house. So Harry looks up at the house as well. And the most outward thing they can see is that the front door is hanging off of its hinges. They do this in the movie, too. It's really interesting because all of this stuff has happened, right? As they're walking up to the house. I'm very intrigued that they didn't hear it, but I'm sure... Horace has put some sort of muffliato dealio something yeah on the house but it stands to reason that he would know that spell as it was written in a book that was in the classroom back from when he used to teach there it's dark I assume that they would see flashes of magic I'm kind of intrigued maybe we were just not being the most observant this night it was up at the top of a hill and through a gate with a garden and most of the magic would have happened indoors I guess yeah but and it is entirely possible that there is some sort of spell around the outside that blocks that presence, too. I mean, they can make an entire house appear to disappear. Yeah, that's true. So, Whatever. magic, Carly, magic. Anyway, Dumbledore tells Harry to get his wand out and follow him, and they make their way through the gate and up the path and into the house that is completely destroyed on the inside. From the outside, you just see the hanging door. From the inside, there's just destroyed furniture like a grandfather clock is just splintered in pieces broken china everywhere the blood is spattered all over the wallpaper they do more blood in the movie i will say yeah it's like dripping down from the ceiling from the ceiling yeah it's to make it more visual yeah dan had to get it on his face dumbledore had to lick it we're not there yet but (laughs) anyway in the book at this point Dumbledore just says it's not pretty and that something terrible has happened there. And I don't know if at this point he genuinely believes something terrible has happened there or if he just knows that he's supposed to believe that and is kind of playing along. Eh. Because he moves to the middle of the room and is just fully looking around the whole scene and then verifies as Harry notices that there is no body. So Harry suggests that maybe there was some kind of fight and they dragged the body off. If it had been murder munchers, could have been Voldemort taking the body to throw him in the lake. (laughs) I do think that this, maybe at the moment, Dumbledore was a little scared. Just maybe for the briefest of moments to be like, oh, shit. Right. Where's Horace? Because, you know, they're coming to find him and 
baby boy's not there. Like, but then once he re- he looked around, took a moment, calm down, look around. Oh, there's shoes under that chair. Well, that wasn't in the book. Well, they didn't describe it, but I bet it was. <laughs> well, they described the armchair as being tipped over on its side. I wish that they had done that because it was really dumb. It that looked it's super out of like, place. Like, hello, you're out of place. They also specifically point out that there is a second armchair mm-hmm. that looks a lot like the one that's on its side. So it seems like... It's not just a random blue armchair in the yeah, room that looks untouched. And, and out of place. So this one seemed to be a little bit more camouflaged in all of the destruction. But Dumbledore is still very aware that it is not what it appears to be. And he just, without warning, basically rushes up to it and jabs his wand into the seat of it. Didn't have to stick it in that hard. Right. Um, what do y'all do? <laughs> uh, the chair yells, ouch. <laughs> and Dumbledore says, good evening, Horace. And Harry is just standing there in complete shock because what used to be an armchair on its side is now an extremely fat, bald old man who's just crouching there rubbing his stomach as he complains that he didn't have to stick the wand in that hard. Blech. He's got a giant silver mustache that is described as looking like a walrus's. And he's wearing a maroon velvet jacket with very shiny gold buttons over a pair of lilac silk pajamas, which always made me wonder if the chair was supposed to be a lilac color and just the darkness of the scene made it not show through. Oh, maybe. But it didn't look very lilac to me. It looked like blue, blue. greenish gray. When he stands up, He actually only reaches up to Dumbledore's chin, but we do know that Dumbledore is pretty tall. So I just imagine him being very short and fat. The illustration that they use at the beginning of this chapter is very correct. Yes. (laughs) It's very round, very bald, very mustachioed man. And that's not what we got with Jim Broadbent. I really like him, though. Yeah, me too. We'll talk more about that at the end. He wonders what gave him away. And Dumbledore points out that had the murder munchers actually come calling, there would have been the dark mark above the house, which wasn't there. Horace kind of mutters that he knew he was forgetting something, but also figures he wouldn't have had time to get that done because he had actually been in the bath, which is impressive. (laughs) In the bath. Manages to get out, get his pajamas Pajamas on, on. put the jacket on, turn himself into a chair and cause the destruction all around the house. Like maybe he had some stuff preset. (laughs) Probably. He says that he was just finishing up the touches on his upholstery when they came in. So he had to do all that all really fast. And Dumbledore says, would you like me to help you clear up? And then it's actually both of them who wave their wand, like identically waving their wand in a sweeping motion, and everything just goes right back to its original place. Any rips, cracks, holes heal themselves. The walls clean themselves of all of the blood. And at this point, Dumbledore asks out of curiosity what kind of blood it was. And I would have loved to see this done this way because everything repairing itself is making so much noise that he basically has to shout it to Horace. And Horace actually yells back that it was dragon's blood. So they do this in the movie, and that is the excuse, not the dark mark. Dumbledore's like, oh, I could tell because it was dragon's blood. The book not having Dumbledore recognize dragon's blood when he came up with the 12 uses of dragon's, or whatever, seven out of 12 12. uses of dragon's blood. What? You know that's dragon's blood. Get it together, Albus. Like, I think that that's really funny. Like, Horace didn't know it was Dumbledore coming. But if he had, I don't think he would have used Dragon's Blood. If Dumbledore had licked it in the book like he did in the movie, maybe he He would have have known. known. (laughs) I feel like he absolutely would have because they eat dragon steak, right? Like, Or they at least use it on bruises. Yeah. I don't know if they eat it. It's described as being green. But I would think then the blood would be green too, but... Maybe not. Who knows? But yeah, it was dragon blood, and Horace does mention that it was his last bottle of it, and prices are sky high at the moment, so concern. 
but he thinks that there's a chance it could be reusable and goes to inspect the bottle of it and is just it's like, oh, like it's a little dusty. At this point, he notices Harry and immediately sees the lightning bolt scar on his forehead, which, of course, causes him to recognize him because who in the wizarding world sees that scar and doesn't immediately know who it is? But he says, oh, ho. Oh, ho. And he actually does that in the movie. And I, I think it's so cute. I love it. And Dumbledore introduces Harry Potter to his old friend and colleague, Horace Slughorn. And Slughorn now immediately knows, I know why you brought him here. This is how you're trying to persuade me. And the answer is still no. And Dumbledore, in a very Dumbledore moment, because in the movie, they did not make him manipulative enough in this scene. Um, Absolutely not. Yeah, in the movie, it's almost like he just sort of gives up. Whereas in the book, Dumbledore suggests that they have a drink for old time's sake, which Slughorn does agree to, but not exactly willingly. It's just sort of like a, yeah, fine, whatever, one drink. Have one drink, and then I'm going to get you the fuck out of here. <laughs> so Dumbledore smiles and tells Harry to go sit in the most prominent seat right next to the fire. It is also well lit by an oil lamp. And Harry's just like, why do I feel like he wants me to be extremely well seen right now? And this proves to be quite accurate because the whole time that's happening, Slughorn is just getting together a tray with all of the drinks. And then he turns around and immediately just sees the well-lit Harry in an otherwise fairly dark room. Yeah. And kind of like does a double take where he just sees him, jolts. And immediately looks away. He gives Dumbledore his glass, takes a glass for himself, and just kind of shoves the tray at Harry to avoid looking at him even more. And then just goes and sits down. I also love the fact that because they described him as so short, that when he sits, his feet don't actually touch the ground. (laughs) So Dumbledore, easing into his manipulating, starts off by asking how he's been. And so Slughorn immediately tries to play up how he's not been good. Like, you don't want me. I'm pathetic now. I'm old. I have a weak chest and rheumatism. I can't move like I used to. And that's to be expected with old age. You can't move like you used to. Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. And Dumbledore's like, "Uh uh-huh. Sure. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, You move pretty quickly to prepare all of this on, what, maybe three minutes? And Slughorn has to admit that it was actually only two since he was in the bath, like I said. He didn't hear his intruder alarm go off, but tries to reiterate that he is a tired old man who has earned the right to a quiet life and a few creature comforts, which Harry notices he seems to be full of. He looks around and there's just boxes of chocolates and all these squashy overstuffed chairs. And he kind of thinks that it looks more like a stuffy old woman lived there rather than an old man. And I'm really sad that we didn't get that you in the movie like he does wear like silk pajamas and stuff like that but we don't get that i live in a fancy house with lace covered stuff like that's what i pictured i pictured right. very much like hepzibah smith like her house that's kind of what i pictured all of the stuff that slughorn has is just like he has pink fluffy chairs yeah. and he has like Lilac all these really pajamas. silky pajamas and he has chocolates and his crystallized pineapple that he loves. And I mean, I feel like if I was a wizard and I could take stuff wherever I go, I absolutely would have that stuff too. If I had to say, I would say Slughorn Secondary House is probably Hufflepuff by his creature. Oh, absolutely. What he likes. It's funny that that's what stuck out to you because I always read that when Harry was thinking that it was looking more like an old woman's house. I always just assumed he was seeing the fact that it wasn't really Slughorn's house because he was just staying there for a week while they were on holiday and then he was going to move to the next place. Oh, no. he. Yeah, but I didn't even think about carrying stuff with him. He specifically says the hardest thing to get in was the piano. Right. And I love that. All of this shit is his. He has put their things away and it's all his because he likes his creature. He does. I also would break into a house for a bath. I'm just saying. You know what? (laughs) For a good bathtub. For a good bathtub. Yeah. You know he picked that house for the bathtub. Oh, yeah. But anyway, he's a tired old man and Dumbledore points out to him that you are nowhere near as old as I am at this point. And Slughorn can't miss that injured hand. It looks pretty awful. 
and just bluntly responds that maybe he ought to be thinking about retirement himself because clearly his reactions aren't what they used to be. And as good-natured as he normally is, he responds to everything pretty quietly and calmly. He just agrees. Yeah, I'm slower than I used to be, but... And it just describes him as spreading his hands out wide and not actually saying anything, but just kind of indicating that age does have its compensations. It would seem so. Yeah. While he's doing this, both Harry and Slughorn notice a gold ring with a heavy black stone set on it, on his uninjured hand. And I love that little touch because we learn way more about that later. Is he still wearing it and it's still a horcrux? He already cracked it. Because Snape asks him if he thought that breaking the stone would break the curse. So he did already destroy it as a horcrux. Mm, Okay. And And he's he's just just wearing wearing the ring ring. to probably fuck with Horace, I think. Because Horace would recognize it. All right, manipulator. (laughs) Like I said, Dumbledore's going to dumble. Other than this brief mention of them noticing it, though, that's all that's said because Dumbledore immediately starts asking if the precautions against intruders was for his benefit or for the murder munchers. Mm. And Slughorn doesn't want to admit this at first, so he's just like, what would they want with a broken down old buffer like me? You can't play a player, man. Right. Dumbledore just says, well, I would imagine they'd want to turn your considerable talents to coercion and torture and murder. I'm actually really intrigued that they want Slughorn. Like, I know he's a talented wizard for sure, but it almost is like Tom likes somebody. Like, he actually has genuine like of Slughorn. Mm, probably mostly because Slughorn is the one who helped him figure out about Horcruxes, but Mm -hmm. this is the most liked person we see besides Snape Voldemort kind of interact with. Yeah, I think that he has a lot of respect for him as his former teacher and knows of his talents and how much he taught him and figures he's Slytherin. Maybe he'd want to be on my side. With Hufflepuff backing him up, so maybe yeah. not so maybe not. not. I don't think that Voldemort believes in secondary houses, though. Probably not. You are who you are, through and through. Yeah. So Dumbledore is wondering if the murder munchers really haven't come trying to recruit him yet, and Slughorn does actually admit that he's not <laughs> given them the opportunity because he's been moving every single week, just staying in different muggle houses, mentioning that the owners of the current place are on holiday in the Canary Islands. The Canary Islands. I like the way he says it in the movie. Because <laughs> he says it in the movie. Yeah, he does. There's so much that is just spot on mm-hmm. here. I like that he seems considerably excited about the Canary Islands, though. He's like, the Canary Islands. And you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> sure. He mentions in the book that it's been very pleasant and he'll be sorry to leave. But it's really quite easy to move from house to house. He just uses a freezing charm on the wacky muggle burglar alarms and makes sure the neighbors don't spot him bringing in the piano, like you said. Yes. So Dumbledore compliments him, saying that this is ingenious, but also manipulation upswing here. Mentions how tiring it must be for that broken down old buffer, using his exact words... In search of a quiet life. But for real. But for real. Like, he's not wrong there, but you know that he's doing this to manipulate him, especially since he immediately follows that up with, but if you return to Hogwarts. <laughs> Honestly, I, that, that sounds fine, Dumbledore. Honestly, let's go. Slughorn's not quite there yet. I know. <laughs> because he cuts him off to say, like, don't even try and tell me that Hogwarts is going to be more peaceful this more peaceful than this. I've heard about what happens to your teachers up there. Don't think that the rumors about Dolores Umbridge haven't reached me. If that's how you're treating teachers these days. That's one out of how many teachers? Right? Like, honestly. And he, ugh. To be fair, so he's probably also heard all of the rumors about the other Defense Against the Dark Arts teachers, too. Well, he's not asking him to come back and be a Defense Against the Dark Arts True. teacher. But that doesn't really bode well. I love this moment. And as good as this scene was, I'm not sure that I can forgive the movie for leaving this out. Yeah. Because Dumbledore points out to Slughorn that 
Professor Umbridge went into the fucking forbidden forest, found a horde of angry centaurs, and called them filthy half-breeds. To like, be fair, she was led into the forest by some of her students, but still. <laughs> she still did that, though. She still did that, <laughs> though. Yes, correct. And Slughorn proceeds to call her an idiotic woman and say that he never liked her, which makes Harry laugh. Same. And then both of the older wizards turn to Harry and just look at him, and Harry's just like, oh, sorry. It's just that I never she was liked her either. Correct. <laughs> And that's where we cut off the chapter because I just felt like that was the perfect split. Yes, it was very good. I guess that we sort of get this, you know, in the movie. We get the very streamlined, tailored version. So Harry and Dumble, they do go a traipsing through the village. Mm -hmm. We see they do slip into the house and find Slughorn and there's a conversation between them. However... As always with the movie, we really just don't get the super details. Yeah. What they did give us was spot on, but there was quite a bit that I was missing. I did specifically note that I am so sad we don't get the fussy old lady. Yeah. Because that makes me laugh every time. But I just see it. I see my grandmother's house. <laughs> right? And that's that's where Horace is living. He's living in my grandmother's I house wish in my brain. that I had pictures of my grandmother's house because you're absolutely right. Like, that is so what this was. Yeah. It should have been. Absolutely. Oh, amazing. I'm glad that I made you think about it in a different way. Like, you yeah. thought it was their house. No. That's no, all I never considered stuff. that before. It's, it Love it. It kind of reminds me of Moody's trunk. Like, that's what Horace has. He has a big trunk oh, that yeah. he just moves from place to place. For in. sure. However, make sure the neighbors don't spot you moving in the piano. Why can't you shrink down your piano? <laughs> I think that was maybe a joke. Just a nice little touch. But, you know, I to think to illustrate funny. that he is bringing his shit along with him. That is my or maybe shrinking and enlarging a piano affects the quality. Maybe it does, and he does not seem like one who would want to mess up a baby grand. No. But that is my saddest thing about this whole thing. Other than they leave out a couple of details yeah. that are really important. But I wanted to see Jim Broadbent be a fussy old lady. I wanted to see him call Umbridge an idiotic woman. That's true. I yeah. would like that too. But overall, I was really, really impressed with this movie scene. Because on the whole, I just remember Half-Blood Prince as being a dumpster fire. When compared to the book. Yeah, and then we watched it together and you were like, oh. <laughs> like, the, it lines up really well it to does. the book chapter. It we does. did not have a hard time figuring out which movie scene goes where. However, there are things so missing. Much missing. Which we're going to continue getting into as yes. we continue forward with this. We get to see Dumbledore for the first time. So we have Michael Aww. Gammon back as Dumbledore. And I feel like he's fairly Dumbledore-ish in this scene. We miss you. I wanted a lot more of him. Yeah. Being manipulative in a very subtle way. I'll say it again because, you know, I just really want that flamboyant Dumbledore. Yeah, You know, and he's very played down. Yeah. He's in gray-blue robes. I want purple robes with stars on it. You're wearing a pointy hat and your heeled boots. Yep. Give me... Some of that sassy Dumbledore. Also, when did he go from wearing three-piece suits to wearing very flamboyant robes? Because Jude Law. You know what, though? Flamboyant robes, probably far more comfortable. Very much so. The older you get. A nice you get breeze. What does he say? What is? I old, like a healthy I breeze, like a healthy breeze my private. Maybe Dumbledore likes that, too, as I'm he sure. gets older. I'm sure. He doesn't seem like one to wear underwear. I have my complaints about Michael Gammon as Dumbledore, but I think it's a little bit less about Michael Gammon specifically. I would have loved it if he had actually read the books and understood the character a little bit better, but I think a lot of it did have to do with how they wrote Dumbledore. For the movies, yeah. Yes. And as my favorite character, I'm very particular about Dumbledore. I have those issues too with Sirius, because if you didn't know, he's my favorite. But God. how do you not love Gary Oldman, though? How Gary do you not Oldman. love crazy Gary Oldman? Crazy man. I love him, though. Everything I see him in. People talk about chameleons. Oh, my God. He's a shapeshifter. He is a shapeshifter. 
just so good. Yeah. And then, of course, we also have Jim Broadbent, who we mentioned a couple of times. Whom I love. Yeah. And other than not being fat and bald. And having a mustache. And having, having a mustache. mustache. He was perfect. And I can forgive somebody for not looking exactly the way that the book describes them if they Correct. can bring the character alive that well. Yes. He did a very good job. I think he does a very good job throughout this movie and the seventh movie when McGonagall's like, it's time that you pick a side, yeah. Horace, and you see his face and you realize he is actually going to pick the right side, mm -hmm. which is a very comforting notion. Yeah. I think he is the only Slytherin that picks the right side. I think it has been said in lots of Wikipedia articles and stuff like that that no other Slytherin stayed behind. Yeah. And all the Hufflepuffs stayed Except behind. for the few Excuse that stayed me. behind for the wrong side. Correct, yes. But stayed back for the right side. Yeah. And um, every Hufflepuff that was at Hogwarts that was of age stayed. I love that they were having to kick out underage Gryffindors as well. It's just such That's a very Gryffindor, Gryffindor thing. thing. <laughs> uh, we'll talk more about that when we, we get will. to that. We haven't really talked about Daniel Radcliffe as Harry yet he's but he also thing. hasn't done much yet so he's doing his thing he's checking we'll, his breath we'll talk about him more when we obviously see him be a little bit more hairy like right now he's just been kind of going with it he is really boring in the beginning of this movie he's not doing a lot of hairy stuff he's doing the weird flirting with the waitress they go he does the like ooh, i just separated and then he's wasn't this the movie that he was, like, drunk during a lot, though? Hey, bitch. I get it. It had to have been really hard for him growing up is through this. Is this the one? Mm -hmm. I think it is the one. I think you're right. Oh, sad. Yeah, so we can address that more as we come to it. But let's just move on to our Potter Pondering. Okay, so this week's Potter Pondering is, what would your security question be if you were a wizard in these dark times? And what's the answer? We're curious. Don't use one of your security questions for oh, password remembering. Don't. Make up something fun for us. Uh, we'll just preface it. Don't use your high school graduation. Don't use your mother's maiden name. Don't use your father's middle name. The don't first use your car. First car. The city where you met your spouse. <laughs> yeah, none or of partner. those. I mean, it's you, you, be smart. Be creative. It's on the internet. People are going to see it. People are going to hear it. Don't put it out there to get your identity stolen. Right? That's not what we're going for. We do not want to steal your identities. We just want to have a little bit of Harry Potter fun with security questions. Yes. Like your favorite gift, which is mine. And that would be blankets. Or your favorite jam. Which is raspberry. Or all of them. Or all of them. <laughs> Find the post on our Facebook page and share your thoughts. Or call us at 216-526-6792. And leave your response as a voicemail. Make sure you start off telling us your name, then go into your answer. Don't forget, you can also stitch your response on TikTok. And like I said before, try to get them to us by Tuesday, one way or another, so we can get them in the episode. We really look forward to reading, hearing, and seeing them. This week's Wizarding Word is about the upcoming Ironton Wizard Fest in Ironton, Ohio. Saturday, November 11th from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. with the Wizarding Ball starting at 8 p.m. And then also on Sunday, November 12th from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Special guests are Chris Rankin, who played Percy Weasley, and Josh Herdman, who played Gregory, Gregory? Who played Gregory Goyle. So that's pretty fun. I've actually met both of them before. One of them was first at Ironton. I got to go with Swish and Flick a few years back. It was a lot of fun. We did Saturday during the day and the Wizarding Ball. It'd be so much fun if we could go again, but I feel like that might be, it's a long drive. It's like four hours. Whoa. Opposite end of Ohio. But check it out. You can look up more information about it yourself. It's irontonwizardfest.com. And like I said, it's in Ohio. So if you're near the Ohio area or can get there for a fun Harry Potter filled weekend, you really should. It's a good time. They kind of shut down the whole town for it. And they've got merchants outside and just lots of other fun activities to do. That sounds fun. The ball is catered. There's food. It was pretty good. Ooh, yeah, okay. it was it was really a good time. And I do wish that I could go back. 
if you do make it there, look for Swish and Flick because I'm pretty sure they are going to be there. I am certain they will be, yes. And if you do want us to share your sorting hat story, you can email it to us at foxsteakpod. Let us know your house, wand Patronus, how you got into Harry Potter, and anything else that you might want to share with us because we are always willing to accept them and we will add them in at this point. We really look forward to reading them if you guys want to send them. But that will bring us to our trivia question. Who is the Quidditch captain Slughorn mentions that made his shelf? The first one who responds with the correct answer and the code word hashtag free tickets will get a sticker. Another way to get a sticker is to rate and review us through iTunes. If you don't have an Apple account, then you can write us a recommendation on our Facebook page. Make sure to email us at foxsakepod at gmail.com to let us know you did and we'll get back to you to figure out which sticker you want and where to send it. Don't forget to find us and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Threads, and TikTok at foxsakepod. Following us on Podbean at Fox Sake Pod will get you the episode as early as possible and give you a leg up in answering the trivia question. You can also go to our website at forfoxsakepodcast.com to check out our For Fox Sake and Harry Potter related merchandise for sale. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we post our weekly podcast episodes, cooking show episodes, blogs, bloopers, and other random videos. If you would like to become a patron... You can find us on Patreon at Fox Sake Pod. Patronage starts at $2 and will get you some awesome perks like For Fox Sake Swag, access to our Discord channel, chats, and more. Check out our page for details. Any support you can give is greatly appreciated. And join us next week when we talk about the second half of Chapter 4, Horace Slughorn and the fairly corresponding film scene. Thanks for listening. Hope you hear us again. I'm Carly. I'm Ellen. And we are For Fox Sake. Sake.